Well, I'm Cody Sandall, pastor for Discipleship at First Presbyterian Church of Bethlehem, and this is our series on leading a small group. This is our first lesson, and we'll be talking about the goals of a small group. It's always good to know what is your goal, so that's what we'll be talking about. What is the goal of a small group? I think for this, we'll be going to a classic chapter, Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, see what it tells us. So here we go, verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone, because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all, as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. I think that there are four goals that this, uh, these verses really highlight in terms of leading a small group. The first one is teaching. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and they spent time together in the temple. One of the goals of a small group is to learn something. And as Christians, as little Christs, we are trying to learn something about what God has to say to us, what what God is doing, who God is, and hopefully we can learn who we are as a result of that. So part of a small group, one of the goals is teaching, is to feed the mind of the believer. Another goal that is highlighted in these verses is community. They had devoted themselves to fellowship, to breaking of bread, and they spent much time in their homes together. This community was growing. There were relationships growing more deeply. They're sustaining and deepening their relationships. Community is one of the most important goals of a small group. It also talks about prayers. They devoted themselves to, to prayers as well. And in addition to that, there were wonders and signs that the apostles were doing. This shows healing. I would call this, summarize this as support. One of the goals of a small group is to have support. When things are really going badly, when the stuff hits the fan, one of the greatest things about being a Christian is that you are not alone. And a small group can provide an amazing level of support in your time of need. Support is one of the main goals of a small group. Finally, they sold their possessions, they spent time together, there were many beings saved. I would summarize this as life change. That there's this tension as Christians that Jesus always meets us where we are, but never leaves us where we are. That it is by grace we are saved, through faith, not by works so that none shall boast, but at the same time faith without works is dead. There's this tension between God's grace and knowing that we cannot earn God's favor, but that the fruit of knowing you have God's favor, the fruit of that is good works. So there's an aspect of a small group that is life change, becoming more and more like Christ. Life change is one of the major goals of a small group. So to summarize, there are four main goals of a small group that are highlighted by Acts chapter 2. Those are teaching, community, support, and life change. So those are the four main things that go on in a small group. Now one of the important things to keep in mind is your role in creating this and making sure this happens. Because a, you are less a teacher and more a facilitator. You aren't the main attraction of the small group. You are the MC. Your goal is to keep things moving in a positive direction, not to be the only one talking. In fact, you should be talking the least out of everyone if you're doing your job really, really well and God is doing something in the group. So your role is to be the MC, to be the facilitator, not the main attraction of a small group. So what do you do if your group is out of bounds? If your group is all community, the people love being together, the members of the group love to talk, they love their relationships with each other, that's why they're there. If your group is all community, one of the things you can do is having a time set aside for transitioning into the teaching and the life change components. One of the things I like to do is to save the opening prayer until after we've had some community time. You know, we've spent some time sharing how the week has gone or how the day has gone, and then you have the opening prayer. It's kind of a, a tool in your tool belt, a way to say, now we're setting aside a different kind of time. 
we're entering into a different space, a different time here. The prayer, saved till then, can help you keep your group from being just all community. Now, what do you do if you are an all-teaching group, kind of the other side of things, that either the members of the group or maybe the leaders or one of the leaders of the group just wants to really spend time teaching and, and learning, to feed the mind. That's all we're here to do. We will do this curriculum come hell or high water. If that's your group, you want to do the opposite. You want to make sure there is time set aside. Maybe you need to spend set a specific cap of at least 10 minutes or at least 5 minutes on community. Going around sharing one high and one low or a joy and a concern. You need to spend some time with community as part of your small group. Or maybe it's all mind and never heart or hands and feet, never applications. But setting aside some time at the end that we are going to stop learning and teaching and now we're going to move into life change or heart what we're feeling and application that goes along with that. So if you're all teaching, you can do those intentional times to keep it in balance with community and life change. And what if you're all support? Usually this looks like one member, more often than not, of the group, but it can be more than one. But usually one member of the group has an awful life right now. And that's a terrible thing. When we as Christians are called to help and be support during that time, but if you're a support group every single week and you're supposed to be a small group that does teaching and community and support and life change, if you're support every week, you are out of balance. And that is going to drag the group to a standstill. You can't let that happen. Some of the techniques for this are to talk with the person who needs support offline, one-on-one, -on -one, to help them engage with, with someone else one-on-one, -on -one, not during the small group time, to help them work through their support. Maybe that's a pastor for pastoral care. Maybe that's uh, someone who comes alongside of them, like a Stephen minister or just a, just another leader who has gifts in those areas. Take them aside one-on-one -on -one so that your whole group doesn't become a support group for that one person. Finally, what if you're all life changed? Now, there aren't many of these groups running around, but I have seen them. I would liken this to, I, I'm a basketball lover. Now, if I'm trying to improve my jump shot, there are a lot of things I can do. I can make sure my elbow is in line. I can make sure I have good follow-through. I can make sure that my shoulders are squared, that I have my right, uh, my feet planted in the right direction, that I jump at the proper time, release at the proper time. But if I try to change all of those at the same time, I'm going to be hitting the rim like crazy. I'm going to be a bricklayer, not making more shots. Most people can only handle one substantive change at a time. And change doesn't happen quickly. So if your group is, I'm going to make this major life change this week, and this other major life change this next week, slow down. One of the ways you can do this is by doing uh, ladder goals. By saying, I'm going to have this one big major life change. I am going to stop lying. And to get there, I'm going to have these rungs on the ladder. I'm going to start by being honest in my job. That when my boss asks me for a timetable, I'm going to give the right timetable. When, uh, if I'm at school, I'm no longer going to cheat off of other people's tests or, or look on other people's homework. That's where I'm going to start. The next, you know, you keep moving up the ladder so that people can ask them, hey, what rung are you on and how are you doing? Where it's change over time rather than huge change every week, it's never going to work. So those are some ways that you can balance your group. To recap, there are four goals. You have teaching, you have community, you have support, and you have life change. And your role as the MC, not the main attraction, as the facilitator, is to keep things moving in a positive direction and to keep things balanced within those four goals. Now, if you are on a mission trip or a retreat, there are a couple of different things you need to keep in mind. Uh, first off, is your group a bunch of people that have never spent time together or hardly any time together? If so, you need to put on more community time so that you can have relationships so that by the end of the trip or retreat, you can actually get to something meaningful. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, what if your group is mostly a group of friends? If you have a friend cluster, and they are a small group. It doesn't have to be that you are a small group all the time. Just people who know each other have relationships already. You want to shrink your community time because that already exists. Set a hard cap. We're only going to spend five minutes or ten minutes on your community time and then move on to the teaching or the life change. So whenever you think about who the people are and how much time they've spent together and how well they know each other, and either expand or contract the community time, 
accordingly. The other thing is that your theme for a trip or retreat may emphasize life change over teaching or teaching over life change. So last year we did uh, Psalms, what's your psalm? And we had to learn a lot about psalms and, and types of psalms and what's going on in a psalm. There's a lot of teaching in that mission trip. So that was a heavy teaching one, more time on teaching. This mission trip we're spending, our, our theme is on what's your story? Talking about parables. So really getting into what is your encounter with God and how do you put that into words. That's a lot more life change than it is on teaching. So we'll have more of an emphasis on what is God saying to you and what is God asking in terms of an action. How do you respond to God and less on the learning, teaching side of things. So based on your theme, you may need to emphasize more of one over the other. So those are some, some context things to keep in mind for retreats and mission trips. Now one of the things you also need to keep in mind is that you need to earn the right to be heard. If you're the leader and they don't respect you, they don't care what you have to say, you are wasting everyone's time. And there are a couple of things to keep in mind here. One is that you have to actually care about the people in your group. And not just care about what they think about you, or what they think about each other, but you have to care. You have to want the people in your group to live as great a life as possible under Jesus Christ. You have to want them to experience something amazing. Because you actually care about who they are and who they become. You are for them. Not against them, not just wanting their approval of you. You are for them. You have to really care. And if you don't, they'll know. And if you do, they'll know. That's a huge part of earning the right to be heard. It's actually caring about the people in your group. The other thing is that you have to keep it balanced. You have to keep those four goals in balance. The teaching, the community, the support, the life change are all balanced, not out of whack. We talked about some of those things before. Those are in balance. Now, they may not say it in words, but they're going to want that balance. Not all community time. Not all teaching time. They're going to want the balance. So if you actually care and you keep things moving in a balanced way, people won't remember what you had to say pretty much at any time, but they will remember if it went well. They'll remember if you cared. They'll remember if it was boring or interesting. Those are the things they'll remember, much less about what you have to say. So focus there. You have to earn the right to be heard. Now, I've, I've talked about you know, the goals of a small group, that there's teaching, there's community, there's support, there's life change. I've talked about your role as the, as the facilitator, the MC, not the main attraction. But what are some practical tips that you can do as a leader of a small group? One of the things you can do is pray. Sounds simple, but let me, let me tell you what it can do. Anytime you lift up someone in prayer, that's a good thing, right? But it can also change you too. I have found that when I pray for each individual person in my small group ahead of time, before we've ever met together, when I spend time praying for each one, I'm more attuned to what God is doing in their lives. The, the application, the life change, becomes a lot easier to notice because I've spent time to hear, God, what do you have to say to, to this person? And what do you have to say that's different to this person? What do you have to say to different this person? Spend time praying for each individual before you meet. You can also pray for them afterwards. You've stopped meeting, you're not together, and you've taken some time aside to pray for each individual person afterwards. Now this is, again, a good thing in and of itself, but it also helps you listen during your time together. Whenever I'm praying for each person after each small group, I listen a lot more to hear, what can I be praying for them? What is God actually doing? What is God up to? You listen better. You're a better leader when you do those two things, and they have intrinsic value. Now, another thing to keep in mind, I'll talk a lot more about this in lesson two, is preparation. And a rule of thumb to know that you are prepared and you're ready is if you can state the main thrust of your small group in one sentence. If you can't, you probably aren't prepared. You aren't ready. For example, maybe your group, your, the statement, the summary is that we want to see our stories as actually part of God's story, not the other way around. That's a, a main thrust. Or maybe your main thrust is we want to talk about how we've personally experienced God's story. We want to, how we've personally experienced God's love or power. One sentence. That's what you're after. That's when you're prepared. Now finally, let me give you 
just a very practical, bare bones version of an outline for a small group. This especially is good for a mission trip or retreat. If you're doing a different context, you can expand or contract as necessary. But one way to start a mission trip or retreat small group is to have five to ten minutes, no more, of community time. Where you go around each person and give me one high and one low from the day. And no one else is allowed to discuss. That's an important thing. That keeps it from becoming 30 minutes. If everyone can talk and laugh and joke about it, then it's going to take 20 to 30 minutes. If you say no more discussion, one high, one low, then you've got to help enforce that because people will push and see if you're really ready and you have to hold back too. One high, one low. One high, one low. If they can't think of one, it's okay. Move on. Just spending five to ten minutes doing that. The next thing you can do is open in prayer. Again, you save that opening prayer to be your transition time to the teaching and life change components. There's your opening prayer. Then you go into the curriculum, the devotional, the Bible study, whatever it is. That's when you move into that. The main thing to keep in mind is that you want to be having spiritual conversations that matter to the people in the small group. That means it's less about the curriculum, less about the study or the teaching. It's more about how can we as a group talk about things that matter to us and connect them to our faith. Spiritual conversations that matter. If you're doing that, all is well. After that time, you want to leave at least five minutes to do prayer requests at the end of the day. And if you need to set you know, your, your watch alarm or get a leader to have you know, their, their cell phone buzz them and they indicate to you that it's time, a lot of times it's easy to lose track of, of where you are and how much time you have left. So setting an alarm can really help you leave at least five minutes for prayer requests and then close in prayer. And that's kind of a, a good summary. So you have five to ten minutes on one high, one low, with no conversation. Then you open in prayer, move into that, that teaching, that discussion time for the, the theme of the trip. You leave at least five minutes, setting an alarm if necessary, for closing for prayer requests, and then you close in prayer. That's a good summary. So to wrap it all up, we've talked about the goals of a small group. There are four main goals. We want to have teaching. We want to have community. We want to have support. And we want to have life change. I want to remember that your, your role as a leader is, is as a facilitator. You are the MC, not the main attraction. You're not the know-it-all. You're not the teacher. You're the one keeping things moving in a positive direction. And that you do that by earning the right to be heard. You actually care about the people in your group. And one of the ways you show that is by keeping the group balanced among those four goals. So there you go. That's the first lesson. And once again, I'm Cody Sandall, pastor for discipleship at First Presbyterian Church of Bethlehem. This was the first lesson on being a small group leader.